But as we begin, we also traditionally invite Uncle Harry Alley to acknowledge our country, but he's uh, had the opportunity to take up a medical appointment this morning, which he couldn't turn down, and so he's invited me just to share some of the words that he would have uh, said, and may uh, we uh, acknowledge country as I do that. Harry's asked me to read that we gather today on land that is sacred, sacred to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians whose ancestors nurtured this land through time, through deep time. But we gather more than 80 years since those momentous days of 1942, which saw our armed forces in critical air, land and sea battles around Australia and our region in defence of our nation. Many Indigenous people have proudly served in Australian uniform, welcomed with dignity into service with our Defence Forces. Together, today, we can all take pride in the courage of those who have served over time and in the culture of our forebears. Today, we acknowledge that heritage with gratitude for its gifts to us all, placing hope in its legacy and remembering the sacrifices that made this oration. We're uh, enormously grateful and excited that we've got Mr Tim Smith, OAM, to deliver the 2023 oration. Mr Smith is the New South Wales M24 Submarine Site Manager. Uh, the M24 Submarine is one of the four Japanese submarines that entered Sydney Harbour on the 31st of May 1942, which led to the uh, sinking of the Cuttable, an anniversary also conducted each year on the 31st or 1st of June. So Mr Smith, in his role as the government's uh, senior maritime archaeologist, is also the site manager for M24's site. He currently serves as Director of Assessments at Heritage New South Wales, that's the state government's heritage agency, having previously served as the Director of Heritage Victoria. Mr Smith is also internationally recognised for his expertise in submarine archaeology, having been involved in the discovery of Australia's submarine, the AE-1, uh, the 1914 sinking off New Guinea, and the AE2 Foundation's work at the AE2 submarine site in Turkish waters, and the underwater survey of Anzac Cove in Turkey. Mr Smith has received a UNESCO Award of Distinction for his heritage management and an Order of Australia in 2017 for service to Government Heritage Administration, to volunteering and to maritime heritage in general. So we're very much eager to hear you today, Tim, and you're bringing to us a, a talk titled the M24 submarine in Sydney waters, recovering an Australia-Japan shared site of wartime heritage. Could we now welcome Mr Tim Smith? Thanks everybody and um, thanks for that warm welcome and um, I also want to um, pay my respects to the land we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation uh, and uh, uh, respect uh, all uh, Elders past and present and I had the absolute privilege in my, in my day job, uh, this is uh, not my day job, some of, some of it's a day job, some of it's a volunteer work. Um, I think my wife gets a little bit annoyed about all the overseas busmen's holidays to um, international heritage sites, but it's, um, it's all part of the work that we do in, um, in heritage. Um, and, uh, yeah, but last, last week uh, I, was, uh, I had the privilege uh, talking around Aboriginal connection to country to be out in Lake Victoria in far western New South Wales speaking with Aboriginal communities there and government agencies that manage that, that lake and water resource and uh, fascinating to see um, a cultural landscape that has 40,000 years of Aboriginal connection documented now um, and uh, just around in the sand dunes over a thousand Aboriginal burials and it really does cement, it drives home the, the fact that Aboriginal people, First Nations people have been here uh, and um, have been across this landscape and I also pay my respects to Aboriginal um, and First Nations Torres Strait Islanders that served in, in conflict and um, one of the projects we'll talk very briefly on because I have a, a problem of having too many slides and having too many, too many conversations so I'll try and keep it focused to um, the, the talk at hand but um, 
um, acknowledge the, um, the, the great service by First Nations people, particularly um, in Australian conflict abroad, um, as early as um, Gallipoli and, and, and will mention. Um, distinguished guests, thank you for um, um, participation today. It's, um, it's an honour to be able to give this a uh, snapshot and I've, I've said to Darren, I've been a bit cheeky, I'm not really talking about the, uh, the battle for Australia, but I am because I'm talking about a subset of that, the Battle of Sydney, and that's a term that's also been coined more recently by researchers and historians, and it's very specific to a particular threat um, that Curtin was acknowledging, uh, which was a sudden and unsurprising uh, surprising, uh, submarine uh, attack, a stealth attack on Sydney Harbour, the capital, uh, the largest uh, a port facility in, in Australia at the time and after the fall of Singapore an absolutely strategic um, port uh, and, and allied base uh, here in Australia's major city so um, we'll, we'll explore that and um, if you can indulge me I'm not I'm not an historian but I indulge in history <laughs> I am a maritime archaeologist so that's my my, my, my professional background um, but for me I'm, 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 I'm I like storytelling I like um, being able to recover lost stories sometimes and some of the work we've been doing with the management of the Japanese midget submarine is very much around the recollections of people that were in Sydney at the time or in the state and the impact this event had on them at a very grassroots level and uh, Sydney on the night of 31st of uh, May 1942 were, uh, was a complacent society even though the threats were around you know, Singapore had fall fallen, half the harbour was full of ships that had just come back from the Battle of the Coral Sea, which would have been a, a, a mixed outcome for the Americans and, and, the, and the Allies. Uh, Darwin had been bombed only in February, but word of that had not really been circulated too much. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, a, a, a sort of fairly standard night on a Sunday night in the city, people going about their business. Um, and they were awoken to war for the first time that was really on the doorstep and as part of the, the battle for Australia this event, the Battle of Sydney, really galvanised people that the war wasn't up there anymore. This was a global conflict, global war, any part of um, the Pacific particularly was, um, was um, uh, at, at risk. So I'm going to talk a little bit, as I said, not so much from the history books, although there's a bit of history, not too many facts, I hope. Um, but I'm really, I want to present something that's a little bit unknown, I, I guess, in the conversations and, and perhaps in past orations uh, here as part of this organisation. Um, what else do we have that tells or explains or, or showcases some of the aspects of those historic and momentous times? And for me, that's the archaeological signature. And Darren mentioned I work at the State Government uh, Heritage um, Agency, Heritage New South Wales, which is in uh, the Department of Planning and Environment. Uh, we have a whole estate remit for protecting the state's most significant heritage places, including uh, um, First Nations heritage. Uh, I also have in my team a really unique opportunity to also manage and deliver the state government's um, protections and controls on archaeology sites across um, New South Wales. Um, including underwater heritage sites both inland rivers in the harbour here in Sydney uh, and offshore and we also manage the offshore component of the New South Wales coast on behalf of the, the Federal Minister for the Environment uh, under the um, Underwater Cultural Heritage Act 2018. So I, I dabble in state and, and Commonwealth legislation on a daily basis and, and also local, uh, local heritage protection. So it, there's a little uh, question there. Oh, that, uh, right. That, that is me, but um, just to say, I, I'm not a military person. I've never served in the services. Um, I would like submarines, but uh, my job has taken me to submarines. And um, I think as an archaeological um, item, they are unique in the archaeological world because uh, they were built tough. Submarines were made strong because they had to go through incredible pressures and incredible environments. So when they're lost in the sea, uh, they last for a long, long time. And as, a, as such, they're a fantastic signature, a record, a moment in time when M24 and its crew of Katsuhisa Ban and Mori Ishibe settled that submarine off the coast of Newport and northern beaches of Sydney on the morning of the 1st of June 1942. That was a snapshot in time. You know, that, that time was captured in that submarine and its setting. And it's an, um, an absolute honour. And, and every time we go out onto that site, uh, it's like turning back the history books. It's like you're in 1942 because you're above the wreck and those men in, who died in combat at that place. And it's a very poignant part of why we kept 
the midget submarine M24 in its battle context because it's, it's sitting in 1942 still, although we're in 2023. So if, if, you, if you go through the talk today, just keep in mind on what is the archaeology adding to the picture of, of what we know of this historic event and the events at, at, at the national and world scale uh, uh, that um, the oration is about. Just quickly about me, I, I'm Darren um, kindly mentioned some of, the, some of the projects I've worked on. This is just to give you a glimpse of other submarines and other projects. Um, the study we do in New South Wales as part of the state government is not isolated to New South Wales. You know, it's not isolated to the work of our colleagues nationally. Uh, we work in this field in an international setting and uh, every shipwreck and particularly submarine all adds to the, the understanding of the past, the history of conflict, of suffering, of loss, of grief, of trauma, uh, and also of research potential and management and conservation and best practice. And as Darren said, um, the New South Wales government through our work on the M24 has been recognised internationally by UNESCO, the premier heritage um, organisation for setting a world's best practice case in the management of the war dead and the Japanese uh, Australian um, relations and, and honour and respect that we both give on the midget submarine, the management of it day to day. Uh, so this project was the A2 submarine, uh, one of Australia's submarines, that first submarines that was lost in the um, Allied attack on, on, on the Ottoman Empire in Turkey in 1915 and, and was the first actual uh, craft and the first servicemen of Australia in combat uh, in, as part of the Gallipoli landings. This submarine went up to the Narrows about 2 a.m. on the morning of um, 25th of April before the troops landed ashore and was already under attack at the time they, they stormed the beaches. So a really important part of Australia's history. Not to say, not to, um, not to outshine what the, what the army did, um, but the Navy were the first in um, at Gallipoli and they were the last out as well. Um, and uh, that was uh, us with the then Chief of Navy in Istanbul uh, as at a conference we were presenting the results um, we are happy, we're lucky enough to be in Gallipoli, uh, in Turkey, on the 100th centenary anniversary, and uh, and um, we're supported by Navy in that. And uh, Rear Admiral Peter Briggs on the bottom um, bottom image is um, our um, uh, director of our uh, expeditions there, and there's an ex submariner from the Oberon class um, boats that were operational here. Um, just very quickly, you know, the, the last one, as Darren said, we've, we, our volunteer team managed to successfully after. About 40 years of searches find the remains of the sister submarine AE-1, which was lost with all hands off the Duke of York Islands in New Guinea uh, on, in September 1914. And these were the first Allied casualties in the First World War in combat operations. And we're now working with the families of those um, very brave men, the British and Australian, and uh, one uh, New Zealander, to honour and manage that wreck which they lie entombed within. Um, and lo and behold, who's got the most submarines in the world? <laughs> Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne. Melbourne's got six submarines. These were gifted by the, the British government at the end of the First World War. These J-class submarines, and they all saw active combat in the North Sea and the Mediterranean in the First World War. They were a bit tired and obsolete when the, when the British government gave them to us, but it was in recompense for the loss of our AE-1 and AE-2 in combat. And they were scuttled, uh, two of them, in Melbourne and, and four of them offshore, off the coastal, in the, in the graveyard. And we, again, we did some quite um, interesting mapping and survey work of these, because they're an absolutely unique archaeological record of First World War technology. And then, as Darren said, I've also done some volunteer projects. We did the first ever underwater archaeological survey offshore at Anzac Cove, Gallipoli and Suvla Bay back in 2010, which was a bit of a benchmark because it, it, it made everyone stop looking up in the hills and the trenches and the cemeteries and the history books of that part of the campaign and repoint people to how did they get there? They came there from the beach, they came there on landings and jetties and piers and, and transports and we mapped all of that part of the battlefield that had never been documented before. And um, since 2006, when Midget Submarine N24 was found, I've been managing that with our project team at Heritage New South Wales. Um, and we were involved, like many others, uh, for a number of searches for that craft over the years before it was found. I think there were about 30 claim discoveries. <laughs> and, and even the year before it was found by no frills divers, um, there was a case that had been found in Broken Bay and we disproved that. Um, just uh, I want to draw your attention to the, just the image of the, um, the sailors in the bottom left. This is part of the flavour of the talk today. This is some of the uh, Japanese um, uh, self-defence maritime um, division that were out here uh, a couple of years ago in a commemorative service at Garden Island Naval Base and then offshore over the midget submarine. And it just goes to highlight the work we do at a state government and the Commonwealth level 
working with the, 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 the consulate and the embassy and with the families of the submariners in Japan, we don't do anything on the midget submarine wreck without that, a conversation with the families of those two crew that are entombed in that site. And again, it's about shared heritage. It's about recognising uh, that this was a time in, in, in history, in war, in conflict. And today our, our relationships are obviously completely different and, and the work of Australian government, New South Wales government with the Japanese government is very close and friendly and we do all of our work jointly on this site and with respect. Uh, and with um, recognition of, of the past and sacrifice. Okay, uh, I, I have to move on because I've got a few. Anyway, um, look, at just talking about this event, the Battle of Sydney, um, I always say um, you can't talk about the attack on Sydney without talking about the attack at Pearl Harbour. And uh, that was a momentous, world-changing event. Uh, but for me, it's, what's really fascinating is the attack on Sydney occurred only six months later. You know, this was incredibly close. That was the first time ever this new weapon, this new secret weapon, uh, a to, uh, Kotai a Teki Japanese mid midget submarine, a Taipei midget submarine, had been deployed in combat. And five carrier submarines deployed five midget submarines in the Pearl Harbor attack for the first time. That was supported by Admiral Yamamoto himself, who was the supreme commander of the Japanese Imperial Navy at the time. And really fascinating to me, he was guided by um, a lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Navy in the Submarine Corps, a Lieutenant Matsuo. And Matsuo is a really important figure because six months later he was in Sydney leading the attack force of the submarines in Sydney Harbour. And three, I, I said two then, there was another one, I-22, three of the carrier submarines that participated and launched midget submarines in Pearl Harbour were then here in Sydney. So the attack force here were absolute Ormeridi combat veterans. And um, interestingly, this submarine, the HA-19, the, the Japanese midget that was um, accidentally captured in that raid, uh, and uh, the commander Kazuo Sakamaki became the first prisoner of war in, in, in America. Uh, they were overcome with fumes, and, and that's one of the issues we'll talk around with the midget submarine here, the complexity of operating these craft in confined coastal defended waters. Uh, uh, the submarine that launched that submarine into Pearl Harbor launched our submarine M24 on the northern beaches into Sydney. So again, there's an absolute connection between those two world-shaping um, strategic military events. And that famous photo of Pearl Harbor has now been almost uh, confirmed to show that one of the five midget submarines at Pearl Harbor did actually get into the inner harbor and fired torpedoes at the battleships in Battleship Row just as the aircraft strikes were coming. So it showed the capability of that um, new weapon. And similarly, you can't talk around the Sydney Harbour mission and the Japanese intentions of holding up maritime trade and, and naval trade and repair here in Sydney at that time of the war with, that, with the influence they were having across the Pacific uh, without talking about Madagascar because at the same time Sydney was attacked, Madagascar was attacked by another submarine force also under the command of overall of Sakamaki. And um, that one was more successful. Two midget submarines got into the harbour there and one of them fired torpedoes that actually hit HMS Ramillies, one of the superior uh, British naval battleships of the day, and put it out of service for a number of uh, months and sank its tanker, the British loyalty. And again, those two crews, like all the Pearl Harbour uh, submarine crews, were lost in, in, in that combat mission, never were recovered. So you can imagine when uh, the Japanese um, Imperial Navy force came to Sydney, and they'd spotted targets like this just out here um, off um, Garden Island Naval Base. They thought they were on a, on a home run. Uh, by then they'd modified the craft, the craft that were deployed on the Sydney Harbour attack. There were three midget submarines. There was going to be a fourth. Uh, it was damaged on, en route. Uh, and one of the carrier submarines sunk by a, a, a US submarine uh, Tortog on the surface. So that depleted the attack force to three in the end. Um, the targets like this were in Sydney Harbour, back from the Coral Sea, a heavy cruiser, US um, Chicago, Northampton class cruiser, just sitting off it, and it's swinging at its buoys and, and an absolute um, um, target. And the intent was this. And it, the, the Japanese attack force were unlucky in some ways uh, and, um, and I think the Australian and, and, and American ships particularly were lucky in others that one of the midget submarines here did fire and it's at, at an unknown target, we don't know which ship it was, um, but its torpedo cage and, um, was damaged and the tubes did not um, e exit the craft and that was Matsuo's craft. So Matsuo had been active in Pearl Harbour, 
had then guided with Aboriginal Yamamoto the attack force in Sydney Harbour, participated as one of the commanders of the midgets and led the raid here. Uh, he, he was unlucky. He lined up some target, whether it was our, our cruiser um, Canberra, maybe the Chicago again, but couldn't fire at his charges and we'll see later he was captured and had to uh, commit suicide with his, um, his other officer. So um, you can imagine if this happened in Sydney Harbour with a capital ship fully armed, uh, full of fuel, full of aviation fuel, these, they had a number of aircraft on board, uh, a, a detonation in the middle of the channel would have blocked Sydney Harbour for months if not years um, and the blast from an explosion of, a, of a magazines like this could have levelled Sydney, just one ship. So it was no main thing that Sydney was facing and I think it, it, the attacks are often glossed over as ineffective, a failure, the, the reward was extremely um, um, significant if they could do it. And as I said, just the scale of, of who was here on that night, or those nights just before the attack on 31st of May, the, 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 fleet, the Japanese fleet assembled off the coast of Sydney by about the 28th. By, by the 29th, they were still flying their last recon mission over the harbour with a float plane. Two of the, the, the I-class carrier submarines, these are the biggest submarines in the world of the day, over 100 metres long, 100 crew in each. As I said, three of them had just come from Pearl Harbor uh, and they were here in Sydney. It's an amazing um, 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 force and two of them carrying float planes and we'll talk about those later. The midgets were bolted to the back deck and the improvements on the Sydney Harbour one, they had a, a, a tunnel that they could go underwater into the submarine. In the Pearl Harbor attack they had to climb on the deck, climb in and then descend to release the midget and they had improved um, depth keeping qualities and compasses taller periscope and a couple of other um, modifications in the neck cage and cutters to make them more effective. And again, Matsuo, building on the experience of the attack force uh, results at Pearl Harbor, had these the Sydney boats and Sydney submarines re reconfigured to be more operationally effective. Um, we call them midget submarines, they're still pretty big, they'd fill up this room. I um, mean, if you've been down to the one which is the composite of the two recovered from Sydney Harbor um, at the War Memorial in Canberra, um, the other conning tower um, from uh, Tumans Midget uh, we'll talk about is in uh, on display at the Garden Island Naval Heritage Centre. Um, there are two crew, two 17-inch um, high-performance torpedoes, 208 batteries, an electric motor. And the main thing with the Midget submarines is once they were deployed from their carrier submarine, they could not recharge any of their, uh, their um, power, so they were completely dependent on the speed and they traversed in and around the harbour in their attack. And at the time, the Allies only had HA-19 captured in Pearl Harbor, so the, and the Australians, and I've seen them in our archives, were shared the information from that submarine that when it was interrogated. Uh, they didn't really put much stock in the fact that they could get here, though. Um, and this, uh, one of the really fascinating parts of the, of the Battle of Sydney, too, is the, the aviation component of it. And again, it's a little bit of an unknown story, so I'll put this in here. Um, there wasn't just a single flight by a Japanese float plane over heavily defended um, Sydney Harbour on, in the weeks prelude to the raid. Uh, there were actually three carrier submarines that had launched aircraft uh, here at the time and the, the first one came down in February, just around the time of the bombing of Darwin. Um, that was I-25 and that uh, float plane flew over Sydney, flew over Newcastle. Uh, I-29 then came down about a week before the raid, was supposed to be in to total secrecy and then managed to get on the surface near Newcastle and start shooting at a Russian freighter with his deck gun, <laughs> which was against all its orders, um, almost gave the game away. Uh, it launched its um, plane and they did a couple of flights around here and also looking at dispositions in the harbour and then also um, flew off Newcastle and I'll tell you a minute, we think they crashed off there and sank it. And then Susumu Ito and his um, navigator in the uh, I-21 part of the Sydney attack force uh, flew a, another sortie around Sydney Harbour the night before the raid. Were, were spotted several times, went out to the heads at night, couldn't find the submarine waiting off the coast, so they had to fly back into Sydney, back around the Harbour Bridge, <laughs> back around Garden Island Naval Base. Thank the goodness for them that the Allies had all the lights on, all the guys welding, all the lighthouses lit up, so they got another bearing and flew back and managed to put their light on. The submarine put its um, searchlight on and they managed to, managed to um, um, uh, re recover the crew, but that, that aircraft also uh, um, wrecked off Sydney. And this is what Ito and his, uh, his navigator basically said. That these are the targets in Sydney Harbour. This was something to attack. Um, this was going to be the, the final target of the attack force. 
So if I, I start off saying, what, what does the archaeology um, tell us of the times? Uh, well, this aspect is an unknown part because these two aircraft uh, wrecked somewhere off our coastline, one of them northeast of Sydney, one off somewhere around Newcastle. So um, if, if, I, if I asked a quick heritage quiz, how many historic shipwrecks do you think around uh, the New South Wales coast? And it, would anyone hazard a guess? About, about 2,000 historic shipwrecks off our coast, about 7,500 shipwrecks around the Australian continental um, waters. Um, but out of all of those 7,500 um, archaeological sites, there are only two Y, um, um, Yokosuka EY 14 I Glen float planes from the Japanese Imperial Navy. Um, and they haven't, one was thought to have been found, but it's not, not certain. Uh, so, again, another interesting archaeological signature lies waiting to be discovered off New South Wales. Again, I won't tell too much time, you, you, you probably all know the facts and figures of the raid, um, but um, one, of the, one of the real mysteries and one of the things we we're hoping the archaeology of the M24 might tell us is what, what factors were influencing the crews in their mission and why were they unsuccessful, uh, why were they detected, um, and what was the, particularly the final fate of the M24 crew. Uh, we know that they were launched off the coast about seven miles out at, at sunset on that night, on Sunday night. So sunset was around five o'clock, the moon was up around six or seven. Uh, but it took them hours to come in. They, they should have got into the harbour much faster. So there's a question there whether the southerly swell with navigation issues, what was, were they waiting, was there some, something happening? Anyway, the first submarine in was um, Truman's midget. Uh, he came in the harbour at 8 o'clock at night, so he'd already been travelling for about three hours just to get into the harbour. Uh, the operational capa capability of these craft was unknown to the Allies. As I said, they, they thought if they ran them at about two or four knots, they might last for 12 hours on their battery. But if they did any burst, th these craft were amazing technology of their day. They could do 19 knots submerged. They were just absolute stealth weapons, and the crews were the elite of the Japanese Imperial Navy at the time particularly um, chosen for their size, their stature, but their intellect and, and, and um, responsiveness to combat situations. And you can see that in Matsuo, um, just in the training before the Pearl Harbor attack, he was in the midget submarine in the inland sea of Japan, and they had, a batch, uh, they had an engine failure and the submarine sank to the seabed with his crewmate. Um, but he was incredibly calm and he let air out his bubbles for four hours until they realised it on the surface and worked out where they were and, and that submarine was recovered. So it just shows how tactical and calm these submarine commanders were and their training was second to none. They were the SAS of their day and that's why in the war, um, you know, Rear Admiral Muirhead Gould, the commander of the um, uh, defence of Sydney Harbour, uh, um, on, on gave them the, the, all the submariners that were recovered at the time um, uh, um, um, f proper formal um, burials and, and, uh, and, and firing um, uh, squads and the remains cremated and returned to Japan during the war uh, because n then and now we recognise the bravery of, of, you know, of them as combatants, they were doing their job. Uh, they were not a suicide mission, they were ordered by Admiral Yamamoto himself to be recovered because of the investment in their training. The submarines weren't. They had two demolition charges on board and that wasn't to kill the crew. That was to blow up the midgets when they effected a recovery with their carrier submarines. And they would set a timer on the demolition charges and the crew would get hop onto the big boat and they'd go off and blow the midget. They were not, um, they were not expendable, they were expendable um, weaponry. But as we saw, um, the first one, M27, came from I-27, came into the harbour and their mission stopped immediately. They, they got hopelessly found in the partly constructed submarine net that was being built across the entrance to the inner harbour at the time. Researchers have suggested they may have thought they were going to run into the wedding cake um, dolphin um, at the time and maybe backed off and backed into the net and got their contra-rotating propellers fouled in the, in the ring net and they couldn't extricate themselves. Um, I haven't got time to talk about the, the, the almost the fast that was the <laughs> response <laughs> by, the, by the, the, the forces in the harbour at the time. Uh, they were detected at just after eight o'clock uh, and famously the night watchman from the MSB, um, James Cargill, rode his little rowboat over because he saw something bobbing in the net. He looked down and went, looks like a submarine. <laughs> and, and he rode over to the, 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 the Royal Australian Navy um, 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 guard boat at the time, uh, Euroma, and said, I think there's a submarine in the net and the commander of the rush, rush. <laughs> so he rode back over again, his nets are submarines, so he rode back over again, he said there's a submarine in the net and they got another officer on board, rode over again, 
looked down and Schumann's midget was in, they were trying to extricate themselves. I rode back to the aroma again and the, and the other officer said, it's a submarine. Uh, but it took two hours for that message to get to Naval Headquarters um, and it wasn't until 10, 10.30 um, that um, the, um, the, uh, the other guard ship, uh, Lolita, HMAS Lolita, came in and started doing depth charge runs over the target. Uh, they did two runs with depth charges and set them at the wrong depth because um, that part of the harbour was quite shallow so they didn't explode. Um, you can imagine the scene inside the submarine at the time. They, knew they were giving the rate up almost at the, at the beginning before anything had occurred. Um, very difficult situation for that crew. Uh, and uh, we, we know, or that we, from accounts at the time and interrogation of the remains, they tried to fire their demolition charges. Uh, only the forward charge, there was one in each compartment, um, only the forward charge uh, detonated, which killed the crew and blew the nose section off and sank it. Uh, but researchers more lately have, have indicated, and I think it's probably true, that they waited to fire that charge two and a half hours after being detected until the Lolita was coming overhead on a depth charge run and they were hoping to take that, at least that craft and its crew out at the same time uh, and, and they weren't successful in that. You would have thought that would have given the game up, but no, <laughs> Ben and the Shibe were still coming into the harbour themselves. So they came in at about 10 o'clock 9.48, they crossed one of the indicator loops. Uh, so this is um, you know, just before Truman and his crew um, committed suicide in the nets, band was already in the harbour and had got through the eastern gate. The, the gate had no gates um, installed at the time, so they followed ferries in allegedly. Uh, and it took him um, from that time, 10 o'clock at night, until he was spotted all the way at Garden Island uh, at 11.30 at night, so at, at an, hour, an hour and a half transiting, hour, hour and a half, yes, hour and a half, they went from the entrance to the harbour to Garden Island, which they should have been able to do in probably in about half an hour, so again, it's a bit of a clue to what they were doing at the time, were they sitting on the bottom and waiting, coming up, taking periscope sightings, fixing their positions, looking for targets. Anyway, the, 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 the really critical thing here, and I'm looking at the archaeological record again, um, Ban and, and who was only the uh, follow-up crew, you know, Ban and Shibe had to um, go on the, the replacement midget that went on um, the M24 because that original crew was injured in, the, in, a, in a fire on board uh, and had to and the midget was lost, thrown overboard. Um, so they, they were Ban was the most junior of the Japanese submariners in the Sydney attack force, but in the end the most successful. Uh, so he got to a position right up off Garden Island, was spotted about here and USS Chicago and uh, started opening fire with its anti-aircraft pom-pom guns and its five-inch guns, which was, they couldn't depress them low enough to hit the target, but you know, the, the submarine was seen as conning tower out of the water uh, and was strafed and you know, some foam and, and, and um, uh, shot up all around it. Uh, and then some of the other Australian warships, the uh, uh, armoured Birchman also started joining in the action. Uh, even one of the officers on the USS Chicago allegedly got his Colt 45 pistol out and was hand firing at the midget submarine uh, from the deck. So it was it was hand to hand combat at that stage, and uh, so yeah, quite quite an amazing thing. And you, it always makes me wonder: Did Ban and Ashibe aboard this craft hear the detonation of their colleagues and Truman in his midget? Uh, because sometime before they got here, that explosion occurred and they would have definitely heard it underwater. Uh, maybe they thought one of their colleagues had been successful and hit one of the primary uh, naval targets, uh, or maybe they didn't understand what that meant, but it was a demolition charge and it was a fatal um, outcome. But uh, quite a remarkable to think there were two midget submarines active in Sydney Harbour at that point in time. Um, as we now know from the historic record, M24 vanished from 11.30, it wasn't seen again. And it wasn't seen until uh, an hour later, 12.30, and it was only seen when its torpedoes had already left the tube and were going at USS Chicago. So quite an amazing feat that um, Ban navigated around here, did something for an hour just in here. Um, you know, it's like not, not a great distance, but uh, we, we, if you're looking at the, some of the war records and some of the Japanese training of the submariners, they had a, in, an absolute instruction. If they were attacked on the surface, they were to descend, go at 90 degrees, of course, and sit on the bottom from, uh, for a period of time to hope that everything calmed down. So looking at that history, that record, and what actually happened in the, the sightings, it sounds like they did just that. They sat on the bottom perhaps for half an hour, moved a bit, maybe sat for a bit more, then came up somewhere near Bradley's head, 
aimed for their shot and took it, the shot at the US of Chicago. One of the real mysteries to me is how did they miss? Um, but there are a couple of clues there. They, they were, they'd been under small arm and small um, heavy calibre fire, um, hot, perhaps a bit rattled. Don't think they were damaged because they were still operational. They were operational enough to get all the way up to the northern beaches. So they hadn't taken any impact that was stopping the servicing and functioning of the craft. Uh, they also uh, were a little bit um, game of this. I'm sure of their skills. They set a deflection target on their torpedoes to 70 degrees. So they weren't taking a shot straight at their target. They were taking a sort of oblique shot and torpedoes would go off at 70 degrees and the, the reason part of that was so they didn't give the game away of where they were located when they took a firing position. Uh, and for some reason both torpedoes missed Chicago, they went down either side of the hull. They were taking almost an end on shot as well which was incredibly challenging at that time. Uh, one of the torpedoes failed to arm uh, and washed up at, on, the, on some rope at the gun wharf at Garden Island and was, and was, was recovered. The other torpedo as we know was successfully armed uh, went under um, the, the, the um, cuttable uh, uh, depot ferry, exploded against the seawall and that blast uh, ended up killing the 21 British and Australian ratings on board. Uh, it also um, is interesting to me is that both of those torpedoes from M24 survived today. That one's in the War Memorial and this one's um, that was found underneath the cuttable wreck when they did the clearance diving and that is the torpedo that exploded and killed killed the crew and it's on display at the Naval uh, Centre at Garden Island. Um, there's another submarine in this story, um, the K-9 submarine, so the Dutch submarine that had escaped Java with two of its sisters, were, it was in Sydney Harbour that night, um, um, moored up outboard of Cuttable. So Ban's torpedo, and there's some thought they thought they set the depth running too late because they thought from Ito's float plane that it was a battleship target and it was only a heavy cruiser, so it didn't have quite the displacement. Perhaps the depth setting was a, an error and it, went, it, it wouldn't have hit the target anyway. Um, but it went underneath this Dutch um, submarine and uh, it was damaged from the percussion as well as the cuttable and from parts of the cuttable coming down, it was put out of service for a time. And I, I, f I found that submarine a few years ago up on a beach north on the north coast near Foster, Seal Rocks. Uh, and surprisingly the beach is called Submarine Beach. You would have thought that was a clue to where I should have started looking, um, but we, we did find it. Uh, it was lost in a towing accident before the end of the war, kind of being towed um, um, for scrap up to Singapore, I think. Anyway, I best move on. Um, the, uh, the other submarine, as I mentioned, um, or three submarines, this one came in extremely late. You know, it came in and got into the harbour at 3am and had been um, had all sorts of trouble at the entrance of the harbour, had been spotted, been depth charged, they crash dived uh, and this is Matsuo's um, uh, um, submarine and in, in that episode um, they'd um, uh, damaged the nets and they'd tried to take that shot, couldn't do it. They'd gone around, when they'd been found around Garden Island um, and the zoo, and snuck back around Bradley's head and went into Taylor's Bay and they were spotted 5 a.m. in the morning the next day. Allegedly a resident there said that she thought that she saw a crew member walking on the forward casing. So perhaps they were trying to look at what the damage was and where the torpedoes were. Uh, and then they were detected in by naval, Australian naval forces and depth charged. I think about 18 depth charges were put in an, in an area of water this deep. And you know, by the second or third one, the crew would have been in a terrible state. Uh, they also tried to fire their demolition charges and they failed to detonate. Uh, and in the end, the two crew, um, the Matsuo senior officer shot his colleague and then shot himself and committed suicide at that spot. So incredibly, incredibly uh, challenging situations and um, mixed results, but you know, part of Sydney's history forever and part of the nation's history and certainly made the, the, the battle uh, for Australia statement by Curtin a real thing. It was really happening. It was happening now in Sydney in real time in front of everybody who mattered. Um, and as we know, M24 successfully fired its torpedoes, missed its target, but successfully exited the harbour. And again, uh, they exited about 2 a.m. on the indicator loop crossing and uh, uh, it left the history books. So it was only when the submarine was found that we had an opportunity to revisit the story of Ban and Ashibe and their operational outcome. Okay, I will move on a bit. Um, the this is just a summary snapshot of, of those three midgets and where they, where they operated inside the harbour. Uh, so as I mentioned, one of the interesting things is why, why did Ban, his 
this one, <laughs> come in um, and spend so long to take that shot. So I've explained some of that. And then he took so long to get out again. So again, it, it suggests that they did the same thing on the exit out of Sydney Harbour. They sat on the bottom at various stages, um, hoped that they weren't being spotted, came up, took a bearing, you know, moved up ahead a bit, maybe sat on the bottom again until they navigated out of the harbour and, and, and into history. And we know through that, some of that through historic um, records of, the, of the, the day, both international some Japanese records. Unfortunately, a lot of the Japanese records um, didn't survive um, the World War II and, and, and bombing of, of some facilities. Uh, so the Sydney Harbour midget submarines and the documentation of them is some of the best documentation we have for the craft and their capabilities because the historic records don't exist and obviously none of the, none of the training or the crew members no, uh, no longer do. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to cover all, uh, all, all our services here today. I've talked a little bit about the Army and their, their engineering work at Gallipoli and Anzac Cove and some of the science. We've talked about the Navy. I'll have to bring the Air Force in. Um, so this is a U United States Air Force um, pilot. Uh, and he's one of the forgotten stories of the Battle of Sydney. Uh, he, was, he died when his aircraft, he was flying a, a US Air Force. He was in the US Air Force um, fighter. Um, uh, command at, based out of Bankstown. He was told to go and do a sortie and look for I-24, and I-24 is a recurring story. So after they failed to recover their midget crew, Ban and the Shibe, uh, the submarines all dispersed, uh, and I-24 came back to Sydney within a week and then lobbed about 10 shells from their deck gun over South Head into the eastern suburbs uh, and <laughs> impacted a number of houses. Only one, one shell exploded because they were, um, 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 I think they were armour-piercing shells, I can't remember exactly. That they, they didn't do a lot of damage, but they did a lot of social um, and um, 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 PR damage because that, that put as much fright into Sydney's heart as, as the midget submarine depth charges around the harbour and flares and, and cannon fire. But when shells were coming into the city, that was a whole other story. Um, and that was I-24. And you have to think maybe the commander of that submarine, after having that midget crew on board for all those years, and all those days, and in Pearl Harbor, um, maybe they had uh, a special sort of wanting to give them some honor by at least having some retribution for their deaths. And so they fired. Um, and um, poor um, the Lieutenant um, Cantello was told to go up and look for this submarine while it was shelling, and he had his engine um, failure and crash. So he's, he, he is another of the, of, of the, of the casualties on, on that part of that attack. And you can see some of the houses today. Um, well, our historical society has got a good, good tour. Um, and again, it's a, a bit of an a forgotten part of the whole story of the campaign. And um, I-21, the one that carried the float plane ETO, then came and did the same thing at Newcastle about the same time and fired some shells into Newcastle. And it was the only time Fort Scatchery actually fired in anger on an enemy um, vessel. And Ito he was interviewed after the war. That he, he lived till about 95, I think, this float plane pilot. Amazing man. I think he remarried at 90. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he was made of sterner stuff. And uh, he, he recalled being on the bridge of I-21 with the commander of the submarine as they were firing their deck gun into Newcastle and this gun firing back at them and the splashes of water getting up and closer and closer and they were up, get out of here and they, and they moved off. And as we said, um, even in the heat, heat of war, the honour uh, that was given to those um, submariners was real by the Australian commander uh, and the, the Royal Navy commander, um, Muirhead Guild, and, and, um, and the Navy services at the time. They, they recognised immediately the, the valour and the courage of these uh, Japanese submariners, even in that time of war, uh, and they were recognised with the formal military burial and repatriation of their remains. And it's that sense that we keep today with the management of this site going forward. So that's the midget submarine attack, and you'd think that's the end of it, but it wasn't the end, it was the start. So we're talking about the, that, you know, that wider context of battle for Australia. This was the next battle, and it's still largely unknown in um, the Australian population today. The submarine campaign that then took off from that attack on Sydney Harbour. Yes, there were more airstrikes on the top end, and again, the, the, the attacks on Darwin and Broome and those ports were by the same carrier force that attacked Pearl Harbor. So again, you had veteran um, pilots and ships that were involved in the conflict at that top end. But it was largely unknown or reported by, um, by Sydney and Canberra at the time. This became more of a difficult thing to, to keep quiet. The merchant ship campaign that then started off, 
And who started it? The three of the submarines from the Midget Submarine Attack Force in Sydney uh, then went on, on patrol uh, off the New South Wales coast and uh, I-21 uh, sank um, the Guatemala, the Iron Crown was sunk by I-27 and the Iron Chieftain by I-24. The Iron Crown's only just been found off um, Gabal Island in the Victorian coast a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, they sank three ships, they damaged two more and they attacked another two that got away. So. Again, it just showed the, c the capacity that the Japanese Imperial Navy had to wreak quite significant um, difficulties for the merchant marine and, and the servicing of the, the, the military operations in the Pacific out of Sydney. Okay, just a little bit of a soiree through the shipwreck itself and then we might just follow, uh, or end up on a bit more of that, um, that merchant um, campaign because the scale of it, as I said, is, is largely unknown and for me it rivals the sort of Germ German U-boat uh, um, campaign on the, on, the, on the American coast. It wasn't quite as big as that, but there were over 30 um, ships that were sunk uh, um, off the east coast of Australia from the resulting submarine campaign. We'll talk, we'll talk soon. So, so the mid sub disappeared. Uh, and wasn't found despite lots and lots of searches and dives and sonar searches and magnetometer searches until 2006. Um, it's in my neck of the woods, I live up on the northern beaches, so I look down from Colliery Plateau over the wreck site up at um, Newport every day, so I live this story every day. <laughs> um, but it is one to live, but it's an, it is an amazing story. And um, as I said, the, when the submarine was found, it, it was immediately an opportunity to answer a whole lot of questions we couldn't answer from the history books, the records, the wartime records at the time, or from the Japanese um, accounts of, of, the, of the campaign. What happened to Ban and Ashibe? Where did they go? Did they go left, right, out? You know, what was their fate? What was their final fate? And where did they end their lives? Um, and lo and behold, a local group of scuba divers, no frills divers, stumbled across the wreck. They had been looking for it, but they stumbled across a target um, out in the sand in the middle of nowhere on the northern beaches off Newport. And as soon as they dived it, 53 metres of water, no mean feat on scuba tanks, um, it could be nothing else but a Kohai Ateki Japanese midget submarine. Um, it was 24 metres long, it had two torpedo tubes, uh, and most importantly, those two torpedo tubes were empty. Uh, and we know the M24 was the only midget that fired successfully in its combat operation. Uh, it was the M24, it had finally been found. So that uh, led to a whole lot of uh, interest from um, both the, the Navy. The uh, Navy did a number of the initial searches and survey of the wreck. We supported them in that work. Uh, the Department of Defence, obviously, at federal level, and the state government and our, our agency got involved in the mapping and protection of the wreck going forward. Um, one of the first things I did was work out where it was on the map and then pull out the maps that came out of Matsuo's midget submarine because they had rendezvous maps that were captured from the two craft in the harbour. And as soon as I plotted up where M24 was off Newport, it's, it was a, a immediately obvious. It was on its recovery route back to its carrier submarine. This is Sydney here. Uh, this is Newport, uh, Broken Bay, and I-24. It was its carrier submarine, and it was told to rendezvous with it. So it was not there by chance. It was there by purpose. So they were trying to affect a recovery by their carrier submarine off that part of the coast. This wasn't the preferred rendezvous, it was one of five rendezvous the Japanese submariners could operate with. Their orders from Sasaki, the commander of the, of the expedition, was to go to the rendezvous off the Royal National Park. Their first choice was this one, and he changed the orders to be rendezvoused south, so that's where everyone historically thought they, they would find the wreck. But for some reason, Ban chose to go north. Um, and this is the wreck today, as it was found. Uh, completely intact on the seabed. We always said it would be found upright and intact because submarines, when they sink as archaeological sites, are heavily ballasted and they tend to sink buried to their sort of floating waterline. That's exactly how M24 presented. What was the surprise to us was how much damage there was to the submarine. It was covered in shipping and tr um, fishing trawl nets and a number of different types from the sort of probably from the 1960s. So it had been found before. Maybe he hadn't been realised the fishermen of one that snagged there what it was. It was out in the sand plain. Uh, but the net effect of that was the conning tower's been ripped off. You see the casing line here. That's the inner periscope um, pressure dome. The periscope's still intact but retracted in as well. Uh, and equally, the, um, the net cutter that was in the forward part of the con conning tower is broken off as down the side of the submarine. Uh, and the, the guards around the torpedoes and the guards around the propellers and all the propeller 
um, no, the rudders uh, have been ripped off by trawler action sometime since the sinking event. But other than that, it's fully intact. So uh, I won't go into, we haven't got time to go into the protection and management. Uh, it was interesting when it was found it had no legal protection. It was, it was too young to be protected by the Commonwealth legislation. And, uh, and um, it, it, um, we had to make a special case for state protection. So uh, we put all that in place with the Commonwealth government, working very closely with the Japanese government, because we, we knew we had something very special whole lot of survey work. We've done about 20 expeditions out there, um, not, some run by Navy, some uh, run by Army um, survey teams. We've had state government agencies out there, water police, ports authorities, a whole lot of um, the, you know, clearance diving team, one from Royal Australian Navy, have done diving operations there for us. Uh, and we continue to map the site and we've slowly worked with the support of the Japanese government and Australian government letting um, some more controlled visitation through commercial dive teams that are mapping the site for us and doing corrosion survey work. There's just a couple of shots of this it's clearance diving team one there. The Port Authority did a fantastic multi-beam sonar survey a number of years ago which really brought the submarine to life on the seabed. Uh, and uh, Gary Jackson, a fabulous um, um, graphic um, um, IT guy, um, and, and has written a number of books and productions on the midget submarine, brought this submarine to life through the historic plans and built them in 3D and animation. It's some fabulous work. Um, why do we know it's a midget submarine? Well, it's obvious. <laughs> um, how do we know the crew never exited the craft? Uh, even though the conning tower's been torn off, uh, there's two clues that the hatch at the top is still intact lying off the wreck and it's still in its lockdown state and most importantly the little access uh, ladder that the crew had to pull down to get enough leg room to get up through the conning tower and, and get out of the craft is still intact inside the wreck and still stowed up in the roof. So both of those clues are evidence that the submarine crew never exited the craft when they sank it at this location. Um, why did they sink it there on that map? Um, my thought is, um, and well, there's a number of scenarios, They'd already been operationally travelling for 12 or 14 hours in the combat scenario. We don't know how many times they had to do bursts of speed to get away from gunfire or navigation or swells and currents. They probably depleted their battery power significantly. Once these submarines fired their two heavy torpedoes, they suddenly shot out to the surface and they had to move counterweights inside and re regain the trim. But then they were wallowing with open tubes at the front, so going into an open sea would have been a problem. Possibly either they went north to go with the swell and make a signal to say, I'm okay, you guys, I'm actually at the other rendezvous point, not the southern one, come and get me here. Um, but most importantly to me, when they got to the northern beaches, it would have been about 6 or 7 a.m. on the morning of the 1st of June, and it would have been daylight, and they would have had possibly power problems, possibly air problems, uh, possibly fumes like um, some of the midget submarines had, like Sakamaki, Sakamaki and Pearl Harbor. Um, but most likely they just knew they couldn't sit on the top and try and affect a, a rendezvous because they would have put the parent submarine and those hundred men at high risk. So their only option would have been to sit on the bottom at that location for another 12 hours and they probably didn't have the power or the air to do that. So my, my summation is they got to that point, they said we can't go forward, we can't go up, we can only end our lives at this point. And they probably did what Matsuo's crew did, um, committed suicide with the service pistol, the officer's pistol, uh, because they didn't fire the demolition charges. There's no evidence of that. So, um, in all of that, and I've been trying to sort of um, paint a picture now, management of the archaeology, we, yes, we are managing the intangible, uh, the tangible cultural heritage of, of the, of the um, the event and what the midget submarine is so important for, it's the largest archaeological relic that survives of the attack. There are bits and submarines around on public display, but it's the only one in its 1942 battle context where it fell in combat um, and uh, entombed those two crews. So it tells an amazing story of the Battle of Sydney, but also the battle for Australia in its early days. Uh, and also, um, you know, the technology of the day uh, and uh, and, and the, the campaign, the mission, what they were trying to achieve, what they did achieve is um, limited but had far-reaching consequences in waking Sydney and Australia to the risk. Um, we've done a number of events to commemorate that uh, bravery, that shared heritage. Um, there's an interpretive sign and uh, 
Consul General of Japan, I'll take you up here. We, <laughs> Kiyosan, oh, we took up just before he departed his posting back to Japan to see the interpreter plaque up at Mona Vale Headland. It's a great opportunity to look out to where the wreck is and, and picture that moment in time. Um, and we've done a lot of commemorative work on the intangible heritage values. So we worked with um, uh, uh, the Eurosenki Tea Society and a number of other bodies to do some ceremony over the wreck for not only the two Japanese crew lying in tomb beneath us under there, but also um, recognising the sacrifice of all of those on the cuttable uh, particularly as well. And uh, Dr Sen, you can see there, was a Japanese Imperial Navy uh, flyer who survived World War II and made his life's journey being um, a peace ambassador. And he was, at this time, the UNESCO International Heritage Peace Ambassador and had gone around a lot of the conflict sites like the um, USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor, He'd spoken at the Annapolis um, Naval Academy in, in, in um, America and uh, other Pacific sites and he came and specifically asked to come to the midget submarine here in Sydney so he could pay respects and it was probably one of the most powerful days I've ever been out there. It was really amazing. Um, the, the other most powerful one was when we were out with Navy on HMAS Melbourne and did a commemorative service with about 19 of the Japanese families of the six submariners. and. Um, Again, that was a very powerful moment. We, we gave them offerings of sand from the wreck in Australian hardwood caskets to take back to their family shrines in, in Japan. And um, lo and behold, the brother of Ban, the commander of that submarine, was on board and through a translator came up to me and shook my hand and said, thanked me for looking after his brother. And I thought that really sets the scene of you know, the effect of these sites and these stories and the legacy of impact it has uh, for people um, associated with these events and um, you know we've done a whole lot of commemorative work it still gets media and TV attention it's Coast Australia TV show did a documentary with us on the site as I said we've had volunteer teams doing 3D animation um, there's still stories to tell about the exploded unexploded demolition charges on board we've been doing some more research Dr Brad Duncan in my team has done a fantastic research paper on that and, um, and we're We've got corrosion um, anode, sacrificial anodes on the wreck now to slow down the deterioration, so there's annual monitoring. There's a whole lot of science around the site now that we're now involved in. Um, and this was one of the volunteer projects using um, 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 Matt Carter led this expedition with the Explorers Club in you know, America, and they did, we gave them a permit to visit the site to do non-invasive mapping of the wreck so that anyone can go and have a look at the site and experience what the M24 looks like. Uh, lying off northern beaches. You can see the bow's been torn off by nets. We don't know where that is. And I'm just about to wrap up. I've got a couple more slides. Um, quite evocative using the technology now. This is all done from video cameras. At that depth, it's quite an operational challenge to capture this and then stitch them all together in, in an accurate three-time virtual model. It's a to upper torpedo tube. You'll see there's a, a hole in the casing after the conning, uh, conning tower. It's not for the demolition charges. That's a neck cutter that was on the, on the, on the conning tower. It's probably more of where the submarine was flexed by fishing trawl hookups. And they've tried to recover their nets from the surface and probably stretch the hull. And it's caused um, um, corrosion. Um, one of the things we are working with the, um, the Japanese government and through the, through the Consul General in Sydney and the Commonwealth is um, looking at controlled visitation to the wreck as a as a um, respectful um, remembrance opportunity. It would be the only, one of the only midget submarines in the world you can actually access in, at depth. And we had approval from the Japanese government and the families of Ban and Ashibe to do that a couple of years ago, which was hugely successful. And it just showed the interest from divers to be able to go and to see this wartime um, time capsule. And they did it incredibly respectfully. And just to end, I, I said I, you know, the, the midget submarine attack in Sydney was a, was a moment in time of one night in time in Sydney's life, but it led to a whole world of, um, of struggle and conflict along the eastern seaboard for another year and a half. Uh, and you can see it's, this story is still yet to be told in Australia and in Sydney. Uh, it involves the Navy, the Air Force, a whole lot of... Um, a, 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 a attempts to sort of mitigate the, the, the impact of then the submarines that came down to our, our waters. And I've, I've counted in my research 15 individual sub Japanese I-class submarines did a tour along the east coast of New South Wales alone, no, I'm not, not counting just um, in Queensland. And you can see the, 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 the hits they had, you know, um, you know, 
I-26, I-174, I-177, I-178 and I-180. All those submarines are active in, at a period sinking shipping along our coast. And about 18 ships were sunk, another 10 were hit and damaged uh, and managed to limp into port and, um, uh, and uh, an another couple got away. But, um, this is one of, the, one, of those, one of those casualties has just been found off the north coast of New South Wales, the Wollongbar 2, uh, which was torpedoed by I-180 with two torpedoes that sank it in two minutes and killed 32 crew. Uh, and that was reported to us by fishermen. They'd snagged it in 90 metres of water off Crescent Head, about 18 miles offshore. Uh, and we led a survey um, and imaged that wreck and confirmed it was Wollongbar. And we've recently done a, a commemorative survey with the f descendants of that crew um, one really sad case where one of the engineers had taken, had taken his son on as an apprentice engineer on the fateful mission and they were both killed. So, remarkable stories. And that's the Wollongbar shipwreck today. So, um, not just, a, a, not just a, a, an episode in historical record, shipwrecks also form mini reef systems. And when this wreck was found, one of the first things we saw was uh, an endangered species grey in a shark population are now colonising the wreck as an artificial reef and, and, gives, and gives another life and another flavour to, the, to these sites and the importance they have um, also in the environmental um, side of um, conservation. Um, and in all of this work, as I you know, I've tried to stress, it's particularly at us at the state government level and the Commonwealth um, Heritage Department, um, the, we, this is about memory, it's about storytelling, it's about truth telling, uh, it's about um, making these stories stay alive and stay in the community's um, sense of, of place, uh, sense of time. You know, these events were world events. They were sometimes more localised, but they were, they were pivotal events. And we are lucky now to not be in that time of war and we're in a time of peace. And particularly in the Australian and Japanese relations are uh, extremely close at the moment. And you can see that by the way we go about the management and protection of the M24 site. It is about recognition, it's about remembrance, it's about re um, recognising courage uh, in, in a time of conflict um, and the need to protect these sites to protect that story and the legacy of those from that time. So I'll leave you on, on that note. I, I guess um, that sobering uh, end of, of the submariners who uh, attacked the harbour um, deserves our respect and I'm glad to see that the Wargrave site is being well protected and that there are no, um, no plans to do anything about it. And I think the fact that there are explosives unexploded on, on board is probably a good deterrent for anyone who might uh, want to uh, mess with it. Um, I must admit that my career as an infantryman, uh, it really reaffirms that I'm glad I took that choice rather than working in a submarine. <laughs> And I have the greatest respect for anybody who'd want to get down in a metal tube and uh, be under the water for that length of time. So look, Tim, thank you very much. Um, on our behalf, it's been great and it's been uh, very informative. So great. Thank, you. thank you. We've met at the RAC club, much grander than any old pub. Tim Smith has well covered how the wreck was discovered of a World War II Japanese sub. <laughs>